Good morning, everyone. How are you going so far? Is it an awesome Tuesday so far? Show me an emoji. How's your day going? Is it a thumbs up kind of day or a thumbs down kind of day? <laughs> Tell me how it's going. Hey, a thumbs up kind of day. I love it. Well, in the part of Manitoba I'm broadcasting from, it's already warm today. I think it's going to be another good one. Like yesterday was like summer is here. So thanks for being with us today. We sure appreciate it. We always thank our funders. So thank you to ERSDC and Manitoba Education and Training. And actually a fun fact for you, I just want to share. Um, do you remember when you signed up for this course, you were given this questionnaire to fill out. It was a registration form and a questionnaire about all this demographic stuff. Well, that form that you filled out to take other classes with us online this year. So in 2020, if you want to take other workshops and webinars with us, uh, by filling out that registration form, it's given you an inside access, so to speak, to be able to take other things with us too. So feel free to check out our website. Of course, I told you last time we did just launch the June webinars that would be happening. And then it un unveil for you what's happening this summer. So I'm going to keep your skills sharp and tune in from your mobile device while you're at the camp for, uh, with us. So today as we jump in, Keeping with handling cash in the workplace. So when you're handling the balance afloat and do a cash, the whole concept of time cards and understanding how they work a little bit different than other other pieces of documentation because those deal with your decimal conversion again and then making change and we'll go over the answers for the homework that you took last time and speaking of homework um, there was a bunch of and um, conversions and so on so she's going to pop on and we're going to go through a review of what we covered last week I think, um, hello everyone, Leah. Um, internet seems to not be, so I'm gonna take off the webcam today um, and just chat. Um, so everyone just, maybe just give me a thumbs up. I just wanna make sure everyone can hear me. Um, Cause I would hate to be talking and everyone looking at math and not, uh, not hearing anything I'm saying. Okay, good, good. All right, so just wanna go through what we were doing last time. So if you wanna, if you have your work three, or sorry, week three booklets out. Um, I just want to go through the answers really quickly. So fill in um, and check your work. So we'll start off with the GST and PST chart. Um, I had you do the last couple. So this is the first one. Your total should have been 508.98. I'll give you a minute if you want to copy that down. Next one, we've got for the $38, your total should have been $42.56. Um, so give me, a, give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Yes, total was given for that one. So it was more a matter of making sure you had the GST and PST right. But for those, both of those two, um, everyone tell me, how did you do? Were you able to get that GST and PST okay? Good, excellent. All right, so the next one was calculating the discount. So for the $39.98, um, who got their $6? $6 off. Give me a thumbs up if you got the discount correct. Does anyone have any questions about this one? Um, if so, please feel free to email. Um, discounts can be a little bit more tricky than just calculating taxes. 
Um, so make sure to write this down just so you have it for future reference. The next one, um, the discount was given, so the total. So it's just a matter of subtraction. But same thing here, it's good to just do it and see how they got the $6.49, just so you know and understand, right? So because um, the discount is a quarter, which is 25%, which is actually 0.25, multiply by the amount, there's your discount. Oh, I have a question here. Yeah, I can go back here. Um, there was just one question, so I'm just going to leave this on for a minute so that they can see um, where the mistake was. All right. So after calculating discounts, we've got taxes and discounts. So this was the larger one that I had you do. Um, so take a minute. Um, see how it looks. See if you're getting what I had. Um, and if you have any questions, definitely ask. So this is the first one. Um, I'll give us about 30 more seconds. Um, if you need more time, um, put a message in the box or give me a thumbs down and I can leave it on longer. This is one of those things where I'm not sure how long I should leave it on, but I want to make sure you've copied down anything um, that you need to copy down. So the next one, we start off with 72.39. Same thing here. You had to figure out your discount what it was without taxes, and then you had to figure out the taxes. So these first two, I obviously, I gave you the answer so that you could make sure you're on the right track, and then the next two, I didn't give you the answer. All right, so let's try the next one. But remember, let me know if I'm moving too fast here. So this one, I didn't give you any. It's always so hard to tell because I can't hear anyone, but give me a thumbs up. How are people doing so far? Most of you, did most of you get the answers right so far? Good, excellent, excellent. All right, we'll go to the last one then. So for the last one, your total at the end with discounts and taxes should have been thirty-three fifty-nine. And as you've noticed, I've showed you the total if you just add the taxes on or if you multiplied it by the 1.12, which automatically adds the taxes. Most of the time, it's going to be the same. It might be one cent off here and there, but that's not a big difference because we round up and down anyway because Canada doesn't use pennies when you're working with cash. All right, well if everyone's got their stuff, we will continue on to cashing out. Okay, right on. Well, you know, our picture is not only inaccurate, here because it's American dollars shown by the pennies. Oh, too bad. We missed the pennies. But uh, all that rounding practice that you did and giving change that you did, I'm glad you did it um, because that's totally real world, real life. And uh, if you become in that place, whether you're a teller or a cashier or a server and you're dealing with cash, you will be in this situation where you have to figure out how much did I take in, how much am I supposed to have, and how much did I start with. So the whole idea of cashing out, and most places would use this phrase, cashing out, they might uh, use a slightly different phrase than that, but the whole idea is saying, hey, what did you start with? 
in your till. And then what did you end with? And the starting point is when they've given you a float, right? So you've had some money already in the till so that you were able to make change for people when they need. And that starting money that you got at the start of your shift or before you made any sales, that's called your float. And then at the end of your shift, when you need to cash out, you add up all of your transactions minus the float amount so that you know what you did in terms of transactions or sales. So for that, there's typically two pieces of paper that you're going to fill out in cash. Chandelier shows it just a little bit differently. So your company um, might have the company logo on it and it might look a certain way. Uh, but this gives you an idea of the function of what you need to do in preparing a float form. So you're, you're going to take some identity to who you are and when you came on shift because um, this is a sort of a double check. Someone gave you the float or prepared the float. So by you identifying who you are and what time you got your float identifies who you got it from. So if there was anything wrong with yours, they're able to go back in time and find out who had it before you or who prepared it for you. And then there will be a whole list of what the various coins and bills are that you have. You would be counting them out. So let's look at the five cent line. It will say, how many five cent coins did you have? So five cents times the number of coins. Maybe you have 100 coins that are all nickels. You would put one, and then you do the math on that. What's 100 coins times 0 0.05, or times the value of five cents? And then you put that in the equals field. And you do that separated by coin and bill. So you go through every th single thing in your till, you add up the number of coins or the number of bills, and then you do the math on it and put the answer in there. In this example, they don't even have the $100 bill mark. So if your company doesn't accept those, that's why it would be empty there. Or if it does, but it's rare, you would typically hand rate that in at the bottom and make a $100 line for that. Sometimes within your till, you'll also have rolled coins, so not the ones that are loose. So let's say again, the nickel rolls. Well, when they're rolled up, it's the value of $2. And by leaving it rolled, you say, how many entire rolls do I have? And then let me multiply that by $2. And I have a total of what the value is of my rolled coin. In a high traffic uh, retail environment, you will have rolled um, rolled coins in your till and if you're getting like to the end of your shift they don't really want you to open them they try to get you to leave them rolled because they're easier for the counters later so there is a good chance that you'll end up with rolled coins and have to be able to do the value in that and when you get to the bottom of course you're totaling up all your total rolled and coming up with a value for that and then you're coming up with a value for all your loose coins and your loose bills and then you can see below that in bold, what is your total float of loose and rolled coins and bills? Now, typically this is around $75, maybe $100. Um, and that answer should probably be the same every time you're on shift. So this is your point to sort of ask someone for help if you've started your shift, counted your float, and you notice that the amount doesn't add up to what the policy is, because the policy is probably that you start with the same amount. If you're in a really busy retail environment, you'll find that that number actually would change, because in some cases, um, you're coming on shift immediately after someone just left. So maybe they left their place and they left their station, and as soon as they've walked away, your manager has offered you the opportunity to start they want you to count what's in the till so in that high pace environment your float amount might be different every time um, just depending who worked for you but float is what we're talking about where you're given money to start with so that there's money in your till and then you can be able to make change for people the other part of the um, float form concept to understand is sometimes you're asked to do a float form before you start and after you after you finish 
So sometimes you have to take out the exact float again and leave it behind for the next person. And so you may be asked to fill out the float form twice, one that shows the date and the time of when you started your shift and one that shows the date and the time of when you ended your shift. And then they know who's passed on the next float. You always count twice minimum, maybe more than twice if you're not sure or you're distracted. Um, so always counting twice doesn't show that you don't have ability. It shows that you have technical skills and the ability to be precise. So do not be shy about counting twice. Usually when you're doing a float, you're feeling totally rushed and someone's waiting for you or you're waiting to get off your shift. Uh, and we just can't emphasize enough that you not only would need to count it twice, but your company might have its own policies about what that is, which sometimes includes the next point that you may need to count in front of a witness. So often with handling cash, um, they want to see you handling it right in front of someone. Now, technology has sped this up a little bit because with the installation of security cameras, um, often they rely on a security camera as the witness. So you might be asked to count your till in the back office or right at your cash register. Um, and rest assured, there's probably a camera on you if you're counting, if you're handling cash. And sometimes they rely on that as the witness. Um, and then to verify with a calculator. So remember last session we talked about the bank teller who was handing out lots of $20 bills or the tell or the cashier who's handing out lots of $5 bills. Well, maybe your multiplication skills with 20s isn't as strong as other multiplication skills. So maybe when you get to the $20 bill line and you have nine 20s, maybe you want to verify that with a calculator and not just do the mental math. You could do the mental math. Uh, but you're certainly encouraged to go along and use the calculator, whether it's on your phone or just beside the cash register. Um, it just saves your bacon if you can do that. And then at the end of your shift, a cash out form is different than a float form. The float is saying, how much did you start with and what kind of float are you leaving for the next person? But the cash out is a picture of everything that happened in your cash register while you were on duty. So it looks similar to the float form because there's the same kind of counting going on, but it's the whole picture. And if we break that down into two parts, this side of it, of the cash out form at the top where you're just counting everything. This is, you're counting absolutely everything, not just the float you started with. You leave that in there, you count absolutely every coin, every bill, everything that's in your till, and you total it all up. Again, not relying solely on mental math, unless you're a complete wizard in that, but using uh, your calculator to come up with those totals. And then the flip side of the, of the form or the other part of the function is to break down everything that happened. So you just counted all the total cash and now you put that in that line. And then you count up all your debit sales and you total it there. Now in this case it says in drawer because you've seen in some retail environments the cashier will keep a copy of the debit slip and will give you a copy of the debit slip. And that's so that she can add them up later. Or he might do that with the credit card slips where they give you a copy and he keeps a copy. And that's again, so he has a way to total them all at the end. Depending what environment you're in, some cash registers do this for you. It just looks back on the sales and gives you a total. Um, but if you're relying on the receipts and that sort of thing, particularly in the service industry, this is common, um, you would be coming up with how much total money do I have? What's the value of all my debit slips that I have? And what's the value of all my credit card slips that I have? And then I have a subtotal of what all my sales were and all the transactions that happened. From there, I'm gonna put that float amount in. So recognizing that float I counted at the start of my shift, maybe it was $75, I'll input that there and I'll subtract my total sales and then I'll take away the float from that number and I end up with a total of what actually happened in terms of value in all of my goods sold. So my total sales is always considered outside of the float. Everything that's in my till except my float, I'll take that away. 
And then there's usually a verification. You know, you're having to sign off that you did it. Maybe someone witnessed you do it or whatever. There's someone in a big retail environment, you go handed into a special office, and then you're marking whether you're over or under and why that would be. Now, if you find you're over or under, um, typically you would go back and recalculate everything before you hand it in. So handing something in that shows I'm over or under on what my sales are supposed to be is sort of a last resort. Um, you don't want to take that lightly because some environments will charge you for the overage or underage. And uh, so go back and re-add and recalculate all of those things. These overages and shortages are just words that I just want to touch on with you because you might be asked, are there any overages? And that would mean that you have taken in too much money. So maybe you have more money in your till than what the receipts show that you actually sold. So probably someone gave you a lot of money and you didn't give them the right change. You undervalued um, the change that you should give them. And a shortage is the opposite of that. Of that. Your, your till shows that you should have this much money, but you don't have that much in there. So maybe um, you didn't collect enough for the transaction. And then different cash out forms, um, they don't necessarily show a place to report loss. That sort of happens at the next step where the bookkeeper goes through all your cash out forms and they will add up and find out, um, is this person typically $2 off? Is this person always short? Are they always over? And did they make the same math error? So maybe they'll come back to you and say, hey, every time you're counting up your, your 25 cent coins, we just find there's a math error in there. Um, but of course, there could be negligence or theft happening. And in this place of handling cash in the workplaces, um, don't underestimate the theft piece. I believe you're probably good people who don't want to steal out of the cash register <laughs> or out of the petty cash box or so on. Um, but that's sort of what the employer side is looking at. So when you're, they don't know what your motivations are. They don't know if you're a good, honest, reliable person or not. So when you're finding overages and shortages, go to them and ask for help on the math side so that you get the forms right so that it doesn't unintentionally point towards loss that doesn't actually exist. Now, handling money, we learned, covers a lot of decimals, right? We're breaking whole numbers into smaller numbers that aren't whole numbers. And that rule also applies when we're talking about time cards and the 24 hour clock. So Leah's gonna take over in talking about how decimals impact us with time cards. Hello everyone again. Um, so when I was, Putting together the work for the time cards, I was sitting there and I was thinking, you know, to be familiar with time cards, it's also important to be familiar with the 24-hour clock because um, a lot of places use the 24-hour clock. So they're not, you know, if someone forgets to put, if they're not sure if it's a.m. or p.m., it's easy. With the 24-hour clock, you know, um, you know, 1,300 hours is 1 o'clock, 1 p.m. They don't have to worry about if it's a.m. or p.m. or things like that. So I wanted to include that before we even got into the time cards just so that people are familiar with that. If you ever started a workplace that has a 24-hour clock, um, you know some tips and tricks on how to calculate it. So calculating the 24-hour clock, it's pretty straightforward. 1 a.m. to 11 a.m. are the same in both the 12 and 24-hour clocks. So that's your a.m. time. Once you get to um, 1 p.m., that's when it changes. But all you have to do is subtract 12. So, for example, if you think of 1,300, if I say, okay, meet me at 1,300 hours, if you take away 12, that's 1 o'clock. That's 1 p.m. So we're going to do a couple of examples here just so people are familiar. Um, so first one. Leah got to go. Leah got to work at 8:30 a.m. She worked a nine-hour day. What time did she leave that day on the 24-hour clock? So in order to do that, um, these are in your workbook as well. I didn't put the answers in because I wanted everyone to try it. So right off the bat, she worked nine hours. So that's going to give us. If you're thinking in your mind how to do this, we know 8:30 to 12:30 is four hours. 12:30 um, to 
five thirty is five hours. Four plus five. Oh, we're not going to worry about lunch breaks or anything like that. Um, all we're doing is just. I'm really just wanting to get you guys to figure out um, the twenty-four hour clock. So if she worked nine hours, that would put her to five thirty p.m. That would be in the regular twelve-hour clock. Now, if you wanted to think about it as the 24-hour clock, 15, 17.30, yes, perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's not really me, but... <laughs> um, so 17.30 would be your 24-hour uh, clock. And if you weren't sure, uh, just think back. We know that 1 o'clock is 1,300, so 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, right? If you've got a... Your fingers to count, or like I said, um, you can use the subtract 12. So that's our first answer 1730. Example number two Rochelle came to work for 1500 hours and finished at 2200 hours. Right off the bat, how many hours did she work? <laughs> All right, 1500, so you would take. What you can do is you can take 22, subtract, yep, 7 hours, good. So, how do we find the time she finished at? Or, sorry, start and finish. So, you take 15, subtract 12, right? That gives you 3 p.m. What time did she end at? You take 22, subtract 12. What does that get us? She started at... One o'clock, right? Did I get that? Oh no, no, sorry. Thirteen hundred hours is three o'clock. Sorry, that's my. Oh no, we're sorry. We're looking at what time she ended. That's ten o'clock. Sorry. So she started at three p.m. She finished at ten o'clock. Um, give me a thumbs up uh, if you are already familiar with twenty-four hour clock. You're comfortable with it. It's always a bit tricky when you're teaching some of these things online because it's so much easier to be able to sit in a classroom, you know, show it on the board, give multiple examples, really answer everyone's questions. So I appreciate your understanding if I'm going too fast or if I don't make sense, things like that. Um, so let's just try a couple. Um, take a minute. What would 5 p.m. be in 24-hour clock? Seventeen hundred hours. Good. How about two a.m.? It would stay the same, right? Exactly. Two o'clock. How about ten fifteen p.m.? What would that be? Twenty-two fifteen. Good. And six thirty a.m. would stay the same. So exactly, you guys, everyone seems to be getting it. You know, you either add the 12 on or take it away, right? If they're giving you the time in 12-hour time, then you add the 12 hours, right? If they're giving you the time in 24 hours and you want to find it in the 12-hour, you subtract the 12. And honestly, too, even just having that little, um, if you look in your booklet, the little picture of the 24-hour clock, just having that to refer to, too. You can look at it and just check. So time cards, um, we're not going to dig too deep in them because most of the time um, you're not going to have to do all the calculations, but it's important to be aware of them and how they work because if you're not filling them out correctly um, or if you're not maybe double checking things, you could be losing income, right? You know, even if someone who is doing the calculations but does them incorrectly, if you don't notice the mistakes, you could lose out on some money. Um, so it's important to just understand how they work so that you can check that those things. So they can be paper or digital. Um, some places you, you know, you clock into a little machine. Sometimes you have to fill them out yourself. I just did a quick little one. I've got some examples in your um, booklet as well. But this is sort of the general, the gist of how they usually work. You've got the days of the week, the time, you have to in and out. Um, obviously, you have 
because the workshop is really a little bit extra to have. So converting minutes to hours, the biggest thing that you have to remember um, with a time card, if, if you were five hours and ten minutes, the hours of the thing convert those ten minutes into the hour format in order to add up your hours correctly. So it's like we talked about before, you need a consistent format. We've got um, Jonah worked 17 hours and 101 minutes. So I mean that could have been maybe he worked you know a couple hours every day and maybe one day he worked a half hour, you know, 30 minutes, another day he worked 22 minutes, another day he worked 15 minutes. It's adding up all those minutes. We have to change those minutes into hours. In order to do that, we divide by 60 because we know there are 60 minutes in an hour. So that gives us 1.68 um, and then a never ending three. We have to round that. We do and we get 18.683. Now, when we're working with cash, we always round to two decimal places because that's what cash is in. But for things like this, you can round to three or four decimal places because that will give you a more accurate number. So for an example here, we've got our time card. We have our in, we have our out, we have our minutes. We know the total amount is 29 minutes, sorry, 29 hours and 120 minutes. So take a minute. How what would our minutes be in hours? You've got to take that 120 divided by 60. This is a pretty easy one um, if you're good with multiplication because 60 times 2 gives us something. Right, we know 60 times 2 gives us 120. We know that 60 divided into 120 is 2. So we add our 2 to our 29 hours. This person's worked 39 hours in total. Now, if you were making $15 an hour, you would times the 15 by that 31. In theory, that's your wage. Now, that's not factoring in taxes or, like I said, breaks and things like that. But if you're just wanting to understand, quickly how it all works. This is how they're calculating your hours and minutes together. Um, so I've got a question here. Um, does it make sense how many hours they worked in and out? So you're looking at, for example, on June 1st, you worked from 9.15 to 3.21. Actually, that one's off. Because now I'm looking at it, 9.15 to 3.21 is not three hours. It should be more than three hours. So I'm going to make a note of that. Thank you. Um, but let's not worry so much about the time in and out. Right now, I really want you to focus on just the, the hours part. So adding up the hours, changing the minutes to hours. No, um, don't worry. Like I said, um, this is our first time through this. And it's one of those things where, you know, we both check it and double check it. But... There's still always going to be a few little tweaks, so I appreciate if you guys see anything, definitely let me know because obviously I want to fix it and make it better for the next time. Let's go to the next one here. So example number two, same thing there. We've got our hours and we'll put them up. So this time we've got 30 hours. So take a minute. What is that conversion? of 196 minutes to hours, what are you going to get for that? You're going to divide that amount by 60. So how many full hours are we going to get in that? And then the rest will be a decimal. So you take that, you're going to get 3.2666, round that to 2.67. So remember now, once you've divided, you no longer have any minutes. 
what you've done is you've converted those minutes into hours. So 196 minutes is actually 3.267 hours. And then you add that to the other amount of hours that you have and you get 33.267. And the reason people convert to the hours is people aren't paid by the minute. People are paid by the hour. So that's why you have to have that consistent format. It all needs to be in hours so that you can multiply it by the rate per hour, what you're getting per hour. So let me know if there's any questions. And if not, we're almost at the end here. Rochelle's going to do a little bit more just counting back, make sure everyone's got that skill nice and strong and the job form, and then I think we're almost done. Yes, thank you, Leah. It's so, it's so key on the time card part because you might be filling out your time cards and getting paid sort of roughly the right amount. But if you know how to do this conversion, you can actually double check that you're not getting missed hours here or there, which is so good. Last session, when we talked about counting back, um, I gave you some problems to take home and to just work it out with your change and your bills and so on. And so the first one here where we talked about 1417 was the amount that was due from the customer and they gave a $50 bill. Um, if you worked that out, can you tell me how you counted back their change? What amount did you give back to them? We would be able to use a calculator and do $50 minus $14.17 and come up with the right answer. And a lot of cash registers will do that for us. But remember we're exploring how do we count that back when we're not with the calculator or we're not with the cash register functioning or maybe instead of keying in $50 and hitting enter, we keyed in $500 and hit enter. And then suddenly the cash register is telling us the wrong number. So just remembering that we start with the 1417 and we're just gonna do counting until we get to 50. So we start with the amount they owe and we're gonna count up to the amount they paid with. So first of all, we would always have to round and get that penny out of the way. And so I would round that to be 1415 and then I'd start counting with a with a nickel I'd make that or probably with a dime actually I'd make that 1425 and then I'd add three more quarters to get me to 15 and then I could switch to using bills so I hope that with your coins that you had in front of you and your bills that you had prepared to practice with even if it was that play money bills um, that you were able to count it out and if we had the luxury to be able to compare what everyone did experience because you find out that people did it different ways. We we counted up with different denominations and some people are more comfortable working with say all five dollar bills or working with loonies and toonies and so we revert to those places of comfort. So it's so important to practice and to count back when you're a customer, not just the employee because you'll get the rhythm that if your till was missing one of those denominations, you'd still be able to give the change. The next one I asked you to work out a two-part answer, right? They owed 1417 as a subtotal before taxes. And then if we want to calculate the taxes, we learned that we could multiply and then add that multiplied number to our subtotal or we could use that trick and multiply it by 1.12 to come up with the $15.87. So whichever method you employ for that is okay as long as you are confident that in the heat of the moment you know how to add the taxes and you know what the taxes are in Manitoba. So if it's GST only, it's 5%. If it's a provincial sales tax, it's seven. And knowing um, that it's a combined 12% if both taxes are due. And then we just switched up the denomination here and said they paid with a hundred dollar bill. So what would we count back to them? And um, there too, if we were in person and we got the chance to compare, it's so cool to see how people get there with the same answer, the same amount of change, but totally different denominations.
I hope you worked out this one because these are the ones that trick people the most. When the number is not close to the denomination they paid it and you're using a combination of change and bills, these are the ones to watch for. It's relatively easy to know if somebody paid me $15 and or they owed me 15 and they gave me a $20 bill, I'm close to the value of the bill. So the counting is really fast and easy. But when there's a gap and the, and the counting is more steps, that's where you wanna do your practicing on your own, just with random numbers and random denominations. So I'm able to show you the answers here to all those questions that we went over together last time. And I guess my challenge for you on the whole counting back is that I really want you to think about how to practice that when you're the customer. So sometimes when I'm feeling all mathy, what I'll do is I'll be the customer paying and I could be at a mainstream store like a Walmart or a grocery store where I know their cash register does all the math for them and the cash register is telling them, hey, give her back $35.83. I know they're getting the answer and I trust that calculation. But just to shore up my counting back skills, when I hand them that $20 or $50 bill and I know how much is due, I'll count that back in my mind about what should they give me in the counting back realm. So always making sure you've got the calculator on you or you know how to use it for those you know, slippery finger moments when you type in the wrong denomination that they've given you, because some cash registers won't actually let you go back. So in that first example I shared about, they owe you 1417 and they've handed you a 50. If you accidentally type in $5 or $500 by hitting the wrong zero buttons, some cash registers won't let you undo that, because once you hit total, it's just giving you the final calculation. So practicing, practicing, practicing the counting back is just going to make your life awesome. <laughs> so, um, you know, that brings us to the point in our class today where we've covered um, some, of the, some of the foundational pieces that retailers have told us they need in people who handle cash in their environment. That being said, if you find that you're in an environment of handling cash and there's a mathematical component that you feel you could use a little more strengthening in, I would invite you to use your attendee chat to send a private message to us as the presenters so we can either add that into the course or work on that with you one-on-one. -on -one. We're happy to help you figure that out in a way that equips you in your workplace and just and just see what what things people are needing there. The other thing is um, we have what's called a jot form. Now that's just a techie phrase for um, a kind of survey you can do online. So you can see in our chat box here, I posted the link for the jot form. I want to encourage you to click on that link right now while I'm with you. And then I'm going to take you through a step with that. You can see that at the very top of your screen, what happened is it opened up a new tab. And if you click on that tab, or in some people's cases, it automatically flips you to that tab. You can see that to the left of it is your Mastering Money Handling tab. Do not hit, hit the X button out of that one or you'll disappear from us. But take a moment in this Money Math Post Training Survey. I'm going to be quiet for a moment and in a moment and let you fill that out. It usually only takes less than 30 seconds to complete that. And I want to ask you if you could complete this JOT form survey at this point in the course, that's going to save you one phone call where we won't bug you to fill this out. So I'm going to be quiet for a moment and ask you to put your name and your email address, and then rate yourself on a scale of one to 10 after our four sessions together, where you feel you moved in your confidence level. Go ahead on that, please. And when you're done, please hit the submit bottom button at the bottom, and then come back on to the tab where our class is and give us a note or an emoji that you're there and we'll continue on.
And we really appreciate you filling this out. Um, this is how we receive our funding. If we're showing um, that people are enjoying our workshops, that they're gaining skills, um, then we can continue to run. So um, we really appreciate everyone filling it out because it, it helps us do our job better and it helps us um, continue to offer these supports, both online and in person, hopefully soon. So we'll give you about another 30 seconds to complete the survey. And then shoot us an emoji or a private chat message that you're back. We've got a couple quick birds there. Thank you. Make sure you hit submit on that. And once you have, you can close that tab. And we'll give it another few seconds. We're just waiting for a couple more. Awesome, thank you, we see that. I'll just give another second or two here. So with that, um, I think most of you have completed the survey and in so doing, um, one of the things I do want to point you to in this attendee chat is over um, on the left there, you can see you can send a message to all participants or you can click that arrow and you can just privately send a message to Liam Mitchell. And that way, um, if you have any questions or feel like you want to work on any specifics, only Leo would be privy to that and your fellow classmates wouldn't know. So that's where we're saying, hey, in your retail environment or cash handling environment uh, or service industry environment, send us that private chat about the things that you need to cover that you feel being put on the spot about at work. Now, when you're not with us anymore and you're on your own practicing this stuff, like I mentioned, um, being a customer who adds things up is really one of the strongest ways to be able to practice some of your skills with handling money and watching the process, right? You probably see lots of good examples of cash handlers out there and some not so strong examples. So your job's enough to go correct all the errors you're, you're seeing, uh, but just to observe that and take that in for what you can do. If there's um, one thing that I find helpful, it's having a little shortcut tool. So maybe, um, on your notes section of your phone, if you're allowed to have your phone at work, maybe in your notes section, you wanna jot those formulas on how do I calculate taxes in that quick shortcut way, or how do I calculate a discount or so on, or making yourself those notes. Or in some cases, people who wear the aprons, they'll keep it on a little piece of paper and they'll have it tucked in their apron so that you've got your shortcut formulas with you. Now, eventually they'll be second nature and you'll know them, um, but having them on hand because in the moment when you're under pressure is the hardest time to remember. We don't want math anxiety, so we want to give ourselves those formulas and shortcuts to have with us. And the other thing is, I don't actually have the same screen as you, so I don't have the emoji button at the top of the screen. But I wish I did um, because I would give you a pat on the back for being here today and learning because whatever job you're in, whether you're handling money or doing documentation or writing or whatever you're doing, um, the, the world is constantly changing and emerging into new technologies and different needs. And, you know, look at where we're at in pandemic. Like they want to encourage everyone to use tap right now and so on. So things change with handling money and different things. So bravo to you for doing that continuous learning on your own time and making it happen. I think you're a pretty cool cat. And Leah's just gonna chat a bit about ways you can engage with us further and what that looks like with our West Centers and what we have available for you.
Yes, so I know many of you are from different regions. Um, so we do have a lot of different West Centers throughout Manitoba. So, you know, if you're in um, Steinbach, they have one there. If you're in Dauphin, they have one. Uh, Selkirk, Winkler, The Paw, Brandon, um, they're all over. Uh, unfortunately, at the moment, they aren't open for people to physically go in, but we are crossing our fingers that hopefully in the fall things will change. But um, like I said, if you ever have questions, I mean, please feel free to email us. Um, we'll do our best to help you. Um, another thing I just want to let everyone know as well is that we will be another part of our requirement to we'll receive a call from us in the next two or three months and the reason for that is because you know when you learn something you don't always see the difference right away it's you know it's a couple months down the line when you've been doing it consistently and your skills have gotten much stronger that you suddenly realize oh you know what I never use a calculator at work anymore or I never do this anymore or I'm so much faster when I'm adding up change or handing back change so um, when you see that call from WEM, please answer because that's another way um, we continue to get our funding. If we hear those positive stories, we hear how you know taking these workshops has maybe increased your skill gain, made you more successful at work, more efficient. We love to hear that stuff. So, so you will be receiving a call in a couple months. Um, and like I said, if you ever have any other questions, please let us know. Any feedback, comments, we're always always open to change and adapt. And thank you very much once again for everyone. You were our first group in the Mastery Money Handling. So I hope you enjoyed it and have a wonderful day and a wonderful summer. Um, we'll direct you to the website where you could sign up for a few more things. Not everything's this intense. You guys did an awesome, rigorous course. We do have some 30 minute webinars that happen every Tuesday morning. And then we've got customer service coming up and Google Suite and a couple things happening in June. So we'll direct you there too. But again, thanks for being here. We're going to close off shortly. And the same emails that you had um, received from us before, feel free to email us at any time. We'd love to hear from you. Have a great day, everyone.